So what we are going to learn today uh, is first the boundary conditions. Um, again, here, I don't want to uh, give you any um, proof, but just want to tell you, just remind you that, that there was a boundary conditions for each component of electromagnetic field. So for instance, like a tangential component, like electric field uh, parallel to the surface between two material, and then electric field uh, you know, on, on one side and the other must be continuous, right? You probably uh, learn all these things when you are uh, at undergrad. And then uh, H field can be discontinuous by uh, surface current density and the surface normal field uh, components, D field must be, I'm sorry, a B field must be continuous. And then D field can be discontinuous by uh, the, the amount of surface charge density. Okay, I guess these are familiar with you, I, I hope. How, how many of you are not familiar with these uh, boundary conditions? Can you raise your hand? How many of you are not familiar with these boundary conditions? Two, okay. All right. Um, yeah, so if you are not familiar with these boundary conditions, that means uh, you, are, uh, we are, you are very new about um, electromagnetism, right? So uh, I, I just recommend you to take a uh, look at basically introductory electromagnetism book. It, it's not necessary, but if you want to understand what's going on, I, I, I just recommend you to read those books. It's kind of, uh, I think it's too much to explain all these things in detail that, uh, in this class. So you can, you can probably check the other books. And the momentum conservation here is not basically a uh, actual uh, boundary condition, but it's um, convenient to use. So like uh, you have four boundary conditions about electric field component that is parallel to the surface, perpendicular to the surface, and the magnetic field parallel and, and perpendicular to the surface. Then you, you can basically solve the situation. So like this, you have Consider that uh, you have a wave, electromagnetic wave, impinging on a surface between two different material. So epsilon one mu one to epsilon two mu two, and the and the uh, the interface is uh, flat. And what you want to know is that you want to uh, calculate how much of light is reflected, and then how much is transmitted how much is reflected and how much is uh, uh, transmitted. So how to solve this problem? Well, it's easy to solve because you already know that uh, this is a, a plane wave. And then you, if this is a plane wave, you know the plane wave form, right? The incident wave, I stands for incident wave. So EI and HI, uh, you know the form of the uh, wave. And then, uh, and then you have a reflected wave and then transmitted wave components. And you set it, uh, set the reflected wave and the transmitted wave, electric field and magnetic field like this, right? And at up to this point, this ERX, ERY, ETX, ETY, all these terms are unknown, right? We, you just set it because you can do this even though you don't know the solution because it's, um, you know, it, it, these are all, all like plane wave solution, right? So what you need to do is you need to determine these coefficients by applying uh, the boundary conditions that I said, right? So I don't want to go uh, uh, actually try to solve this, but uh, you, can, you, can, uh, you can solve these equations by applying um, the, the boundary conditions that I mentioned. And if you do that, uh, you know that the reflection coefficient, which is the 
amplitude uh, between the incident light and the uh, electric field amplitude ratio of reflected light to the incident light. And that is given like this. And then uh, transmission coefficients are given like that. And here, uh, theta t is the angle, you know, this angle, the transmission angle, and theta i is the incident angle, and the uh, uh, eta uh, is called wave impedance, which is defined like this, okay? So the ratio between uh, permeability, magnetic permeability to the electric permittivity. And then uh, there are two options, like uh, th this is one solution, and uh, this is for TM polarization. What I mean by TM is transverse, uh, transverse magnetic. So here uh, you see the electric, the magnetic field is perpendicular, normal to the plane of incidence. So the plane of incidence means the plane that is defined by the incident K vector and the surface normal uh, 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 direction. So this vector and surface normal uh, vector defines this plane, basically the, the, the screen, right? And this screen plane is called a uh, plane of incidence. And then if your magnetic field is normal to the plane of incidence, this is called TM polarization in this case, or uh, people also call this as P polarization. Okay. And then uh, on the other hand, you uh, also have the case that electric field, not the magnetic field, but electric field is normal to the plane of incidence. In this case, it's called TE polarization or S polarization. Okay. And then you can, you can solve for each case and you get the reflection coefficients and transmission coefficients. All right, so then uh, what, what's happening uh, if your electric field or magnetic field is like uh, in the middle? So what I mean in the middle is none of the electric field or magnetic field are perpendicular to the uh, plane of incidence. So all you need to satisfy is actually K vector and the electric field and magnetic field are mutually perpendicular, right? So they are mutually perpendicular, but electric field, of course, can be some random direction. Like, like let's say some, uh, if you draw some uh, circle like this, which is perpendicular to the K, electric field can be some this random direction, for instance, like that. And then uh, magnetic field, of course, uh, need to be perpendicular. So. These three, uh, K vector and E field and H field are still mutually perpendicular, but not like uh, TM or TE polarization. So uh, why don't we need to take, uh, you know, uh, how can we treat this situation? Like assuming that we know the solutions of TM polarization and TE polarization. And then if somebody asks you to solve the case for uh, this case, like uh, electric field is not perpendicular to the uh, plane of incidence nor the magnetic field. How do you deal with, deal with this? So if you, uh, so everyone's following, like uh, what, what I'm asking, is that let's say this is the K vector. And then let's say, uh, you know, uh, this is your plane of incidence. So I'm making, I'm basically turning your, uh, my screen 90 degrees. So I'm looking uh, the K vector, the, the wave uh, from the, you know, the front. And then what we solved was that electric field is either this direction or that direction, right? So this direction, when the electric field, if this is a plane of incidence, then 
if, if the electric field is this, this is called TE polarization. If the electric field is that, this is called TM polarization. But there are many cases that uh, electric field can be somewhere like between here, then magnetic field might be like this, but still they are mutually uh, perpendicular with each other. So how do we deal with this? I guess many of you are already, yeah, sure. Yeah, Ian Jae said, uh, we divide, uh, we basically decompose the wave into two parts, right? One is TM part and the other is TE part. So let's say your electric field like this, then uh, you can decompose it into TE wave, and I'm sorry, TM wave and TE wave. And because the electromagnetic system is linear, you can always decompose it solve it and then just add them, right? So once you know uh, the, the solutions for TM and TE polarization, then uh, anything in the middle uh, can be just solved uh, by decomposing it into uh, TE or TM. Okay, so thank you for answering E uh, in J. And, and, and I guess many of you already knew the, uh, the answer, but kind of too shy to type in uh, the chat. But please, uh, if you know the answer, try to type in. Okay, so uh, the solutions. If you actually draw the uh, the reflectance and uh, transmittance, no, there's no transmittance here. Actually, what I'm drawing here is the reflectance. So reflectance and reflection coefficients are different. So what I used small r here is a reflection coefficient. So it's like the ratio between reflected uh, electric field and the incident electric field. And of course, this uh, value can be a complex number, right? Because electric field component can be complex. And then reflection uh, or reflectance is the about the energy. So uh, you know, uh, you need to uh, like this. You need to do, uh, get the magnitude of it. So here I show two cases, like uh, from air to water and say water to air, right? And then uh, the reflection of TE wave and TM wave, if you look at this, uh, so it, uh, as a function of instance angle. So you can look at see here is water and air, and you're looking at uh, how much of light is reflected as a function of angle. And as you can intuitively uh, know, that as you increase the angle, so if your angle becomes more and more like a glazing angle, then your reflectance increases, right? So compared to normal incidence, this high angle incidence uh, case, there are more reflection occurs, okay? For both T and TM wave. But one special angle uh, occurs for TM wave where uh, you have zero reflectance, okay? Whereas uh, TE wave, it's monotonically increases. And here, uh, the other case, like you uh, have, uh, you shine light from the water side to the air, then you can also uh, uh, observe like similar tendency, like a, the ref reflection increases as you increase the angle, but from certain angle, the reflection becomes 100%, which is called a total internal reflection, right? Jeonbansa. Everyone is familiar with Jeonbansa, right? Like uh, a total internal reflection. So how many of you never heard of total internal reflection? Can you raise your hand? Oh, okay, total internal reflection. Oh, there are some actually. Okay, well, yeah. So this total internal reflection happens uh, when 
when a light impinges from a high index material to a low index material and above a, a critical angle, all the light is just reflected and no, no light is transmitted, right? So, and, and, and even in this case, if you look at this, TM uh, polarization has zero reflectance angle. This is also a special angle, which is called a Brewster's angle, okay? So there are two special angles for uh, 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 plane wave behavior. One is Brewster's angle. The other is the uh, critical angle. Above the critical angle, total internal reflection occurs. At the Brewster angle, zero reflectance uh, occurs for TM wave only. And then why TM, only the TM wave has the Brewster's angle and why the TE wave doesn't have anything like that, uh, that is actually obvious uh, if you look at these equations, right? So uh, again, like I don't want to uh, spend too much time on this, but uh, just look at this. Like in order to have a Brewster's angle, you need to make this term to be zero. Right, and then this term and that term must be the same in order to be zero, right? And then here also, uh, if if you make if you want to make R T E to be zero, then you want you should make this term to be zero. And then now, if you look at the impedance wave impedance, it's defined as mu divided by epsilon. And then at uh, light frequency, our visible frequency most of the material is non-magnetic. So what I mean by non-magnetic is that, uh, uh, you know, magnetic response is same as the magnetic response of a free space. So there's no magnetic response basically due to the material side. So uh, you can just simply uh, compare to a free space eta, your uh, wave impedance at a given material can be just simply written as epsilon divided by uh, epsilon zero divided by epsilon. Okay, epsilon zero is from uh, free space, epsilon uh, is from the material. And because epsilon is almost always larger than epsilon zero, so your eta supposed to be larger than eta zero. I'm sorry, your eta is smaller than uh, your eta zero. So you know that fact, okay? So let's, let's think about uh, from air to uh, water, okay? So now you know that uh, eta one is for air, eta two is for water. So eta two supposed to be smaller than eta one from, from this conversation that we said, okay? So eta two is smaller than eta one. So in order to make this to be zero then, cosine theta t must be larger than cosine theta i, right? Then, only then you have a chance that you, uh, you, you make this thing to be zero. And if you look at this, when the index of water is larger than the index of air, of course, theta i is larger than theta t. So if you take the cosine, cosine theta t is actually larger than cosine theta i, right? So even though eta 2 is smaller than eta 1, cosine theta t is larger than cosine theta i, so that there's chance that you can make these two terms to be the same, so that there's a chance that you, you can make this thing, you know, the, the RTM to be zero. And if you look at this case, RTE, uh, eta two is smaller than eta one. And then cosine theta T is larger than cosine theta I, right? So there's no chance that they, these two are uh, become even, right? So this is a very uh, simplified explanation why you cannot have Brewster's angle for TE wave, but you can have for TM wave. So more importantly, in order to have 
a Brewster's angle at for T E wave, uh, this uh, condition needs to be removed. What I mean is that you need a magnetic strong magnetic response in order to have a Brewster's angle uh, at T E uh, for T E wave, but this is not the case for almost all materials uh, in nature. All right, so uh, do we have any question? Okay, well, uh, if you have a question, you can just type in, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll um, come back. Uh, so uh, what's the use of total internal reflection? Uh, people use total internal reflection for wave guiding. As I said, total internal reflection is like this. You have a light impinging on a surface, and then this light cannot escape the structure, but just internally reflected with 100% reflectivity. And then, and then this keeps going on so that you can use this uh, phenomena for guiding light. And, and this has been used in optical fibers, right? So in optical fibers, uh, the index of an optical fiber is larger than the index of air. So you can, you can make you, uh, your light to be guided through the optical waveguide, I'm sorry, uh, the, the optical fiber without any uh, loss. And what's the use of uh, Brewster's angle? Uh, it's, it's a bit, uh, th this is not actually the use, but uh, this is a demonstration of Brewster's angle. So um, what you are seeing is, uh, you are looking at the same situation here. This case and that case, these are the same situation. The only thing different is that you put a polarizer in front of your camera, okay? So here it's unpolarized. There's no polarizer in front. And here uh, your light, your uh, camera uh, has a polarizer. So it accepts only certain polarization of light. So in this case, if you look at this, uh, you are basically seeing the light from the outside, right? Reflected off uh, from the surface of window, and you're looking at this light, right? Most of that, that's the most of thing you, you, you are looking at. And here in this case, uh, instead, you are looking at the light from inside of the door, uh, inside of the room, right? And then you somehow was able to filter out the light uh, from the outside, right? So, uh, so how to do that? That's the, that's the question. Like in order to do this, uh, your polarization, your polarizer uh, accept uh, what kind of polarization? Can you answer? Let's say sun was here, uh, and then uh, the light was hitting like that, and then coming to you, and then here also the same case. Then uh, you want your polarizer to be this direction or that direction. OK. 
Can you answer that question? Well, um, so, so it's like this. As I said, at a certain angle, some uh, like you can, you only have a S polarized light in, a, in your reflected light. So what I mean is that from the sun, of course, uh, it's it's uh, uniformly polarized. It's unpolarized. So so the light has both uh, S and P polarization, right? And then once it hits the the window, then what's happening is that if you're if you're exactly at the Brewster's angle position, then uh, P polarization experience zero reflectance, right? So it just penetrate. And then S polarization is reflected. So the uh, light, even though it's unpolarized, the light uh, hits, hits the window, be, uh, is, becomes S polarized, right? So all you need to do is filter out that component. Then what you're looking at is the uh, unpolarized light, like uh, basically the the, the light from the inside, which is still unpolarized, right? So what you need to do is to filter out the S polarization. So uh, your, your polarizer must be along this direction in order to filter out the S polarization, the polarization uh, that, uh, that, that electric field is, is uh, you know, uh, polarized in that direction. I hope this is clear to you. But anyway, you get the point, right? Even though you don't understand uh, exactly uh, how you know this direction thing works, but you know the flow, right? Um, sun has unpolarized light. Unpolarized means uh, there are all types of polarization mixed. And then uh, if you're at Brewster's angle, uh, after the reflection, there is only S polarized light survives. So all you need to do is just to filter out that component. Then you don't see any light from the sun reflected off from the, uh, uh, from the window. So that's uh, what I wanted to say. And uh, if you talk a little bit more about the total internal reflection, uh, I just want to explain uh, a little more about the, um, the you know, um, Snell's law. So you uh, probably everyone knows the Snell's law. Snell's law is N1, N1 sine theta one is equal to N2 sine theta two, right? N1 and N2 are the index of refraction. And then sine theta one and sine theta two are the angle like this angle and that angle, right? It's N1, N2. So this is uh, uh, Snell's law. And then, uh, so when theta i is larger than the critical angle. So let's look at uh, here. So say sine theta one, is N1 over N2 sine theta two, right? And then if the uh, sine theta one uh, is larger than, you know, arc sine of uh, N, N, N2 divided by N1, then uh, there's no uh, 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 transmission occurs. And in this condition, uh, you can compute cosine theta t. So I'm sorry, uh, theta, this is incidence angle and transmission angle, cosine theta t. So cosine, so let's, let's do this first. Cosine squared theta t is one minus sine squared theta t. Okay, so this is obvious step. And then 
uh, science carrot theta t from the Maxwell uh, from this uh, Snell's law, you can switch this to this number, right? And then, uh, uh, what else? Right. And then, and then here, n one divided by n two is actually defined uh, as uh, one over sine theta c. So here it's defined in this way, right? Squared is smaller than one. So, uh, sorry, uh, this is smaller than zero. So if you look at the cosine theta t, cosine theta t uh, is purely imaginary because cosine squared theta t is negative real number. So cosine theta t is purely imaginary number. Right, and now uh, what's the implication of this? If you look at this, uh, if you look at the uh, reflection coefficients RTE, RTM, cosine theta i is purely real. There's no problem about the incidence angle. Cosine theta t is purely imaginary, right? And here the same, purely real and purely imaginary. The same thing happens here. So. If you simplify this equation, the ref reflection coefficients have this form, purely real number plus purely imaginary number. And then because these two have the same form here and there, they have the same form. And, and the uh, numerator also has purely real number minus pure imaginary number. So if you draw this in a complex plane, uh, denominator looks like pure real number and pure imaginary number. So this is like your denominator and then pure real number and pure imaginary number, but with just a negative sign, this is your numerator, right? But their amplitude, complex amplitude are exactly same. So if you take the amplitude of it, it's always one. Right, And so uh, reflectance becomes always one in this case, when the theta, the incidence angle is larger than the critical angle, right? So it's, it's easy to uh, prove it um, with the given equations. And, and another thing uh, that I want to let you know is that the other side, like when we, first try to solve this equation, you have an incident wave with K1 and the reflected wave with K, I'm sorry, KI, KR, and the transmitted wave is KT. And then transmitted wave KT has two components. One is surface parallel component with sine theta T. And then the other is surface normal component with sine uh, cosine theta T. And then as I said, uh, cosine theta t is pure imaginary, right? That's what we do here. So cosine theta t is pure imaginary. What does that mean? Uh, that means uh, if you look at the uh, the uh, the prop uh, the the wave vector of the transmitted wave, uh, its surface normal component is not real, but it's imaginary. So what's the implication of it? If it becomes an Im imaginary number, then if you take e to the i k r along z direction, your field is decaying exponentially instead of oscillating. So you see what I'm talking about? Like e to the i k x is oscillating solution, right? And then e to the i, i k x if you do something like this this becomes e to the minus kx right so it's exponentially decaying solution so uh because cosine theta t is pure imaginary your electric field and magnetic field uh, is the same it's decaying exponentially as you move away from the interface so it's not like uh you have zero field uh in 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 on the other side of the medium so uh what's happening is more like this. So if you have a total internal reflection, total internal reflection, 
you have an incident light and you have 100% of light reflected in terms of energy. And then if, if somebody asks you, okay, then what's going on here on the other side? There's no field at all. Well, there are fields, but it's just decaying exponentially as a function of time. So it actually looks like this. If you, if you uh, zoom up this region, then your incident light and the reflected light looks like this. And on the other side of this, you see the electric field is decaying. Okay. Then you can probably, then somebody can probably ask, then, okay, so there's a field then. There's, then why not energy is just, uh, you know, leaking out? So it, I don't know if for some people, this may sound a little contradictory because on, on one hand, I said uh, the 100% of energy, incident energy is reflected back. And on the other hand, I said, but oh, there are still are fields here. So that, you know, it sounds like there's something's, you know, leaking off. So uh, what's happening uh, is that uh, even though you have a exponentially decaying field, this decaying field never uh, transfer energy along surface normal direction. How do you know this? You can calculate uh, uh, pointing vector. So if you if you calculate the pointing vector, then uh, with these all these settings, you will realize that uh, your pointing vector is becomes actually. Uh, uh, you know, there's, there's no energy flow along this, uh, you know, surface normal direction, even though there are fields, okay? So that's how total internal reflection uh, actually looks like in a microscopic scale. Why do I tell this? Because it becomes important uh, in, in some cases. Like for instance, uh, you can think of this kind of situation. Uh, medium one, medium two, but this medium two is very thin, okay? And then let's say you have another medium three. Then, uh, as I said, uh, because your electric field is actually exist, but just exponentially decaying. So if medium two is thin enough, then you can have, you can make uh, this total internal reflection not happened and catching up this field uh, to, to actually convey energy, okay? And, 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 and this can actually happen uh, in, in, in this case. So um, this is called a frustrated total internal reflection. So you can see here what you are looking at is a uh, obviously a uh, cup with water in it and you're uh, grabbing the cup. And if you look at here, all these parts where there's, you know, there's no contact with hand, uh, you see the total internal reflection, right? There's no, you, all the light is just reflected back with 100%. But here, where the uh, where your uh, hand is makes making contact with your cup, total internal reflection is frustrated, and uh, you actually uh, have a uh, non perfect non perfect reflection, and so it's 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 like this it's this kind of a phenomena is and then and then you can make high contrast between the region uh, where your hand actually makes a contact and the region where uh, your uh, finger actually doesn't make a contact and then, and then you you have a fingerprint and and fingerprint has ups and downs and only ups can make a true contact uh, so that uh, total internal reflection is frustrated but the region here, like between the uh, tops of your uh, fingerprint, uh, still total internal reflection happens so, so that you can actually make a large optical contrast, right? So if you just look at, look at your fingerprint, 
uh, in, a, in a bare eye, uh, you know, they don't make this type of a contrast, right? But if you use this total internal reflect, reflection, only the part that makes a true contact uh, with the surface, uh, the total internal reflection is frustrated. So you can, you can make a big contrast and then they, you, people use it for uh, finger, uh, fingerprint uh, detection. Right. So any any question so far? All right. So if there's nothing, I'd like to move on to talk a little bit more about a a, uh, a dispersion. What so um so in order to introduce what is dispersion and why it's important, I, I just want to introduce like two waves superposed. So imagine two sine waves with slightly different k and omega. So you have one wave with k1 and omega1, the other wave with k2 and omega2, same amplitude, and k1 similar to k2, k, uh, omega1, similar to omega-2, but they are not the same. And then if you're looking at uh, the two waves combined, then it's just a sine this plus sine this, and then you know uh, how to combine two signs, right? It's, there's a, a formula. So if you use that formula, then the, uh, the, the addition of two sine waves can be a multi uh, product of cosine wave and sine wave. And then inside of uh, the product, the cosine, uh, one has differences of K1 and K2 and omega one and omega two. And the other has summation of K1 and K2 and omega one and omega two, right? And now we define, uh, because they are similar, we can uh, take an average of it to define it as a K bar. And then similarly uh, take the omega average and this is omega bar and then take the difference. You define Delta K and then take the difference of omega, you define Delta omega. And if you do that, it's reduced like this. Okay. Two A naught multiplied by cosine Delta K X minus delta omega y, delta omega t, multi, uh, multiplied by sine k bar x minus omega bar t. Okay, so because k1 and k2 are very similar, so if you compare delta k and k bar, which one should be greater? Can you please uh, answer in the chat? Like delta k and k bar, which one must be larger? This is obvious question, right? K bar, yes, thank you, right? K bar is much larger than Delta K because K1 and K2 are similar. So this is much larger than these two. Then how can we draw this? Well, this is fast oscillating term. Let's say T equals zero. Then how can you draw it in the uh, space coordinate? It's like this. You have slowly varying component fast varying component. So if you have a slowly varying component, that slowly varying component acts as an envelope, right? And then fast varying component is doing this, right? So this wave actually looks like this, slowly varying component and then fast varying component multiplied. And then what we do is uh, we define the movement of this envelope as a group velocity. So how this envelope moves is defined group velocity. And then how the actual phase oscillation moves is called phase velocity. So phase velocity is omega bar divided by K bar. And then group velocity is delta omega divided by delta K. 
right? And of course, they can be different. There, there's no reason that they are actually the same. And then if you uh, do this, you know, uh, take this into a limit uh, that delta k becomes zero, then phase velocity is still defined as omega divided by k and group velocity is defined by d omega dk, right? Delta omega delta k. So these are two different things. How they are different, uh, uh, let, me, let me show you. So these are two examples. So if you look at the, the one in the bottom, uh, the green dot is the node point of envelope, right? So this envelope moves with very slow speed while the actual phase point, the red dot moves uh, very fast, right? So that in this case, group velocity is uh, two times small, slower than the phase velocity. This is an example of group velocity is actually slower than the phase velocity. And then you can also think of like more drastic example as, as like, like this, what I draw here. If you look at the group, the entire chunk, where this entire chunk is moving, your entire chunk is moving to the right right? Entire chunk is moving to the right. But if you, if you try to follow a certain specific uh, phase point, it actually moves to the left, right? Chunks move to the right, but the fa actual phase moved to the left. So in this case, phase velocity and group velocity are actually in opposite direction, right? So which one is more important? Which one has more physical meaning? Uh, it actually, there are actually the, the group velocity uh, is what, what actually has a meaning and what determines the uh, speed of uh, basically the energy transfer and the information transfer, okay? But anyway, a phase velocity also matters. So, uh, you know, these are the distinction between the phase velocity and group velocity. And there are a few uh, uh, examples. So dispersion relation, as I said, is a relation between k and omega, right? Omega and k. So linear dispersion, like in electromagnetic waves in vacuum, omega is ck. C is the speed of light. So uh, group velocity and phase velocity are the same, right? In this case, this is C, this is C. There's no, you know, they are the same. But uh, let's say um, two Broglie waves, like electron waves, for instance. Then electron waves, omega is C k squared, right? As if you know that E, uh, the kinetic energy is one half mv squared and mv, is uh, your mv is your uh, momentum. So it's a momentum uh, squared divided by 2m. So energy and the momentum has quadratic relation in this case. And in that case, group velocity and phase velocity are different because d omega dk gives you factor two out. So group velocity are two times faster than the phase velocity, right? And then there, there can be also a square root relation. There's, there's deep water waves. I'm not sure what that is. Probably mechanical engineers knows better. But anyway, if omega is uh, proportional to C delta uh, square root of K, then you have a factor one half uh, uh, in front. So the group velocity becomes slower than the phase velocity. So, If you look at the dispersion relation, uh, dispersion relation tells you a lot about a, a lot about the uh, the the phase. I'm sorry, the group velocity. So if it's a linear uh, thing, then uh, the, your group velocity and phase velocity are the same. But it's uh, sublinear, like this. Then d omega dk 
which is the slope, is actually slower than omega divided by k, which is the phase velocity. So if you look at the uh, dispersion relation, you know how your uh, wave uh, moves uh, in terms of um, group velocity and the phase velocity. And assuming that uh, you have a very unrealistic, but like, let's say you have omega proportional to one over k, okay? And in this case, in this exotic dispersion relation, then uh, your phase velocity and your group velocity can be different direction, can be opposite, right? Because if you take the, uh, take the slope of it, which is a group velocity, the slope is negative, right? While actual value is positive. So phase velocity and group velocity can be opposite. And you may think that this is very fictitious. Like, um, you know, even though I'm discussing all these things, maybe this is not even uh, realistic. You can never uh, make it happen. But in fact, in nanophotonics, we can actually engineer the uh, dispersion relation of your mode. And it is actually easy to make your group velocity to be opposite direction to your phase velocity. So you can, you can engineer the, the dispersion of your mode uh, by doing you know, nanoscopic uh, manipulation of light. All right, so this is it for the first uh, lecture note.